So welcome everyone. Thanks Systream for organizing this event. I just arrived this morning. I got some nice food, so that was a perfect welcome. And also thank you for actually naming a street after me. That's quite impressive. So thanks for all organizing this event. I'm a bit nervous today because I'm from Switzerland, your friendly little neighbor next to you. Because usually I was working and you know giving speeches, etc., far away <laughs> from Switzerland. So you can go and hide if it doesn't go well. So we will see how we go today. I put a lot of content together. I hope I can you know, give you some ideas about social engineering and how you can do social engineering today more in a professional way. So that social engineering is actually accepted by companies and they want to pay you for it. But also give you an idea how powerful social engineering can be. In preparation of this conference, you know, in the office, when I'm hiding around and moving around, I got asked, ah, Dominic, Dominic, you go to this uh, hacking conference. I said, no, I go to a security conference. Okay, that was the first one. Towards the last week, towards the end, I said, ah, Tom, now you're leaving. I know it's Friday, so you have to go there for this hacking conference. I said, no, it's a security conference. <laughs> it's semantics, but it's important. Then after the third one hit me with that, hacking, hacking, that's all what's in people's mind, right? And then also he, had, he said something really sweet. He said, Tom, you're going to this hacking conference. I said, no, it's a security conference, not a hacking conference. Be sure you put on your privacy screen. I said, OK. If that's the biggest problem at such a conference, I take my privacy screen with me and put it exactly here. So aside from that, um, I do security, different stuff. You will see a little bit of it, but it's not about me. And uh, probably I can say I'm from the category super paranoid. So don't be afraid. Everything you hear, see, and has to be considered in this context, OK. So I do information security stuff. That's why I usually tell people. It's not IT security. It's all that comes with information, classification, encryption, etc. all these things. Google knows me. You will find me. I'm there. And there's some Twitter. I'm not so much into Twitter because I work. I have a job to do. Other people, like maybe my mother-in-law says, oh, yes, you're within IT. Can you bring me the printer upstairs and connect it? So it's always such a different understanding. Maybe you have a similar experience. Oh, yes, you work within IT. Can you fix me this? Can you fix my TV? Can you fix that? So it's such a perception thing, what you actually do, but what your job is. And quite frankly, it's really difficult to explain. So for today's session, uh, despite my name and the naming of the street after me, I'm honored. Uh, my French sucks. <laughs> Sorry about that. I really would love to have addressed you in your language, but I can't. I speak a tiny little bit French, but not enough to give you the information clearly enough. And when I think it's important, I have to switch to English. So sorry for that. A little story here, because a friend of mine, his French even sucks more <laughs> than mine does. Because when I was about 20, we used to go to France and all these other places, Spain, quite a few times a year. And there, we were in the car with no GPS and the map. And usually, there was a driver, and there was uh, somebody on the passenger seat. And this was the GPS. And he had a map. And my other friend with the map, whose French sucks even more, who said when we were ordering food, he usually said, moi aussi. Or if it's really getting worse, was just pointing to it. Then one time, we played a little prank on him and said, look, there is this sign, you see, in the circle. So find this city on the map. Look for toute direction. And then he started looking on the map for toute direction. And I think it took him half an hour until he realized there is no bloody toute direction, <laughs> right? So language is important. I'm not capable of very good language command, but I try. So that was our French stories. There are a lot more, but can save them for later. So what do I really do? I protect my clients. They are up here, federal governments, police, authorities, clowns, etc. From this, the bad stuff, and where 
wherever it's required. So I spent a couple of years overseas, here and there on projects. So that's what I do in big steps. So this is also how this framework came about. And also we used to have a little joke when I was uh, at KPMG. What is the difference between a framework and a method? $100,000. That's it. So <laughs> make your pick. But we call it a framework because it's a collection of processes and methods. You can apply for social engineering. So you, you get a methodog methodological approach to social engineering. Because companies want to have results, predictable results, and want to have results which are based on risk. They don't want cowboys or anything else there. So this is the definition of social engineering as we understand it with this social engineering engagement framework. It's the elicitation of information. I don't say there are a lot of other definitions out there for social engineering, but some of them were evaluating something like collecting bad information, um, stuff like that. But for us, it's just elicitating information, collect information by different means. So either through networks, human beings, and based on methods and tools. And based on methods and tools because we want to have repeatable results. If I do a social engineering pen test or an approach or write policies, whatever, paper stuff, I want to do it again next year. And I want to see, has the situation improved? Is it any better? Are people still susceptible to this approach or attack? That's why we have created one, another um, definition of uh, social engineering. So why is social engineering as an APT so underestimated? I call it really underestimated, because I think it's, it's powerful. It gets me so much information I can get from the people's or the human's software. It has flaws. And they're wonderful, by the way. And also, I really don't like the definition of that the human is the weakest link in the chain. You really have to think about this one. I think the human is actually your strongest link you will ever have in any chain. Because humans are saving a cat from a tree. Humans are steering the car into the curb if there is an accident. Robots don't do that. So I think you really have to also appreciate the humans here, not just make them villains. They're not the weakest link. It's maybe just an excuse for bad engineering, OK? So because it is hard, there is no software or hardware you can buy. There is no appliance. So none of the vendor can go there and say, oh my god, social engineering is so cool. Buy this one. It has four 8 gig links. It costs you $75,000. There is nothing you can buy for social engineering. And also, it doesn't have its own logo. Have you ever seen social engineering logos? Probably not. But I made a little mistake. There is actually stuff you can buy which helps you with social engineering. There is hardware or appliances you can buy. I will quickly show you them. So the first ones are actually regarding talk prevention. It's effectively mitigating the risk of talk mitigation. They are temper resistant, as you know from other devices like smart card readers, etc., etc. Maybe even FIPS 140-3 certified. They come in appealing colors. The only problem with them was they're not really widely accepted by the user, but they would work 100%. That's one of the appliances you can buy if you want to protect your users from social engineering attacks. Didn't really made it uh, in the Gardner Magic Quadrant, though. So what's with writing prevention? We have the perfect devices for writing prevention, too. This will actually stop users from writing bad stuff, like password on post-it notes, uh, reputation damaging sentences, or stuff like that. They come in steel, carbon fiber, or in the executive version, pink plush. That's how they look like. The small ones actually are for the thumbs, right? If you don't know, if you never have been arrested. 
Then we have the third device, which could work for social engineering and tech and preventing them. Because you will still have users who can text with these things on, right? They still can do stuff. So, and some of them actually enjoy these devices. I think I saw some smiling faces there when I showed these tools. But anyway, so you have to diff apply a different mitigation strategy for risk. And that comes in all sizes for me as well. And that's the next appliance you can buy. So all of them actually are appliances you can buy, but acceptance is quite low. So the best thing is awareness is so much better, OK? And also for the rest, call your social engineering guy to do some awareness sessions, not sessions with these tools, OK? So I think that's an important idea or concept. How do you patch? the human software or brain or function or whatever, there is no tool. You can work with awareness or you need to support your user with some tools or processes. I go now to the next topic, which is uh, the logos. You know, you know all these logo things. Each vulnerability must have now a logo created. I think there's even a whole industry in creating logos for vulnerabilities. And I did actually get asked this question about are vulnerabilities without a logo actually also dangerous? That's a true question. So social engineering has no logos so far. The logo, it's very interesting because I did a lot of work in the aftermath of shell shock, heart bleed, etc., and was presenting some kind of state of the nation, uh, some strategic advice, what to do, what not to do. Is it really dangerous or not? I was involved with the uh, outsource provider in terms of, hell yes, we planned for maybe four hours downtime. We have a support window for upgrades. What do we do with these vulnerabilities, etc., etc.? That was a big mess for a lot of companies. Actually, it also, was also a big exercise for those companies, okay? So they could try their uh, DR process. Is it working emergency patching? Is it working, etc.? The interesting thing was, though, <laughs> If I presented this strategic or state of the nation reports, these little advice notes with logos, you get more budget. That's true. If you fix the vulnerability with the logo, you get more budget. Plus, if you then have this vulnerability solved in your company and say, I stopped heart bleed, it's no longer a threat, we patched everything, you become a hero too. So you also have to think about the psychology of these things, how that works in a business context. And frankly, I'm not sure if it's a good thing if management or executives only react to logos, right? That's a problem. Because all these nice other vulnerability just pass by because they don't have a logo, they don't have a name, they don't maybe are zero days. On the other hand, it's maybe a good thing for hackers. So that's why I actually created these logos for social engineering. I just finished them a couple of weeks ago. You can use them. I think I will make them available to you in the, in the context of the conference. So you have logos for whaling, for shoulder surfing, for spear fishing, reciprocation, some of these things we will look later a bit. So you can describe, you know. If you also look at CVS or Mitre, where they have all the vulnerabilities, the database of the vulnerabilities, there is not a single one about social engineering. There is not a single one from one of those in there. And that's maybe also would be a way of, of highlighting the importance of those vulnerabilities. So I hope also I can, con can contribute with those logos to make social engineering visible to you, maybe to your management in terms of risk, Also, regarding the attacks and why it's still kind of an underestimated APT, every large attack has some social engineering components in it. I do also, as a part of my work, I do like reverse engineering or I do attack analysis where I look, uh, how has, been, uh, has this attack been executed? What were the steps? Where did it originate from, etc.? All this work to take it in slowly apart, not on a technical level. 
you can say I'm more of a paper guy, so I can't code, but I take it apart. Why has this attack become so eminent? Why was it so big? And also with Carbonac 2.0, I don't know if you know it, 100 banks you know, were uh, involved in that one. One billion was stolen with this. Attack had also a very important component in the attack path was social engineering. Looking at the passwords, command and control server connected to their clients using their cameras and looked up what they were typing to get access to these codes so they could steal the money. Money mules eventually got it from the ATMs. Now, the interesting thing with this one was there were about 20 banks from Switzerland involved. And I can say I know probably know really all of them. In some way uh, or function, I have done work for all of them. I know their data centers, I know their infrastructure, I know their protection they have. I also know their appliances. And I think for me, this one is so important because they have, I can tell you this, they have the greatest, they have the latest, they have the most expensive, the most complicated tools and appliances in there and networks and protection levels. But still, they got affected by this. And then you have to think. And even if you say now, oh, okay, yeah, look, this bank was kind of more, you know, I don't know, at Cisco, they are more checkpoint, blah, blah, whatever. Still, even though, even more, they had all the software and hardware that is available. They have really great people in security, but still they got hacked. They lost. Of course, this is just pocket money for them. That's why there is no big deal about it. But for me, as a CISO, I'm also doing work as a CISO. If a company hasn't one or needs one or is changing one, I'm jumping in this role, be with them for a while, I would freak out. Because <laughs> not even with all the money you have, you can buy an appliance or something protecting you from this. That's kind of really scary. I would freak out. What do you do next? What can you buy? What is your exit strategy, aside from updating your CV as a security officer? So it's really important also to look at the broader picture, what's going on there, I think. Also, I mean, you all know that here specifically, I think, uh, hacking is a business and business principles apply. So also from a socioeconomic perspective, it is cheaper to hack a person with some effort, or a lot of effort, I will show you some method later, then to hack a two-factor strong authentication. So I do expect even more attacks based on social engineering and based on methodological social engineering and with structured approach. So what are social engineers? Are these just the guys that can't hack and code? Or what do they do? Who is a social engineer? I think everyone is a social engineer. There is not a social engineer apprenticeship, or there is not a social engineer uh, course at university. So it is a mix, and you need all these tools to become maybe a social engineer or understand social engineers. I think social engineers, they're just normal people. They love ducks. They're friendly, animal-loving people. They love turtles as well. And they love pineapples. Do I see some faces smiling? <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? This is what I'm talking about, OK? That's Pineapple Nano Wi-Fi. It's the land turtle injection platform. And it's also the injection platform the Robert Ducky called. It's not a product endorsement, OK? But social engineers, even if they can't code, need tools. And they need commercial-grade tools. Because from a social engineering perspective, I don't have time to play around. And that's with this whole framework. The framework is just can guide you developing attack vectors, different attack vectors. And you can apply different methods. If you think this method is really cool, use it. If you are very known to another method, use this one. The framework is just helping you. So that's just an example of some of the tools that can be used for social engineering or to, put, or to support social engineering attacks. 
Because what I said before, with every large attack has social engineering components in it, it's the reverse here. Let's say every large social engineering attack has some technical com components as well, because we need data. Data is an asset. Every phone number of yours is an asset. Every street number, every certificate number, every SSID, IMSI catcher, Bluetooth, fingerprinting, etc. All this information is money. I do also some volunteer work and also work with kids on security. And really the part that's hardest to grasp is why is it so important security and data? And what I usually use is like, okay, I have money here. You can do that with poker chips or something else. And then you say, okay, this is your name. This is your phone number. This is your home address. This is your color you love the most. You give them all these chips, right? And then you go back to them and ask, oh, by the way, I have a cool free app, but give me, give me all these chips. And then they start thinking, no, why should I give you all these chips? It's a, it's a heap of chips, it's physical, it's tangible, right? What do you give me in return? And then that's exactly the moment where it clicks, and that's the moment with everyone, it should click. Data is an asset. Every small bit is an asset. And you wouldn't give your assets away just like that, because it's cool, it's free, and it's an app. So this critical thinking is important, and also in terms of protecting your environment or the company you work for or whatever. Data is an asset. So, and by the way, if you once become a target of a social engineer, it's actually an honor because there are not many who get a target of a social engineer. But what do you do if you once are connected to such a device or if you are, have one of these things in your laptop? So, first thing, don't panic, because you are in good hands, a social engineer is right next to you. Don't panic, it doesn't matter, because you have help at your hand. What do you do next? Second, don't remove this device, because you don't know what it does. You have to leave it there, because maybe you break something, and that's not good. You don't want to tell your IT department that you are breaking something. If you see such a device, just leave it there. Leave it rest. Then third, very important point for risk management. Remove it, put it to your CEO's laptop or device or your best friend's, because that's a principle what's called shared responsibility. Every CEO says that. You can come to me with everything. I have an open door policy. Do it, put it in there. IT will be proud of you. And I think fourth, that's a very important step. You have to look for the information and you have to make sure that you're not compromised. So you have to go to this website, www, don't get me and enter all your credentials. It doesn't make sense if you just enter a bit, because, you know, when you enter only a small bit of your information, you cannot be sure if you have been hacked with all the information, other information or not, if all your other accounts are secure or not, and if your credentials have been compromised or not. So, if you have done this, the social engineer will actually tell you, thank you for cooperation, you will hear from us. These are the social engineers, okay? So, <laughs> don't worry, but it is actually quite interesting, and social engineering is, is a skill that's there forever. I think it's in our head. It's a thing that kids do to their parents. And the human operating system is there for a long time, and it needs mat maturity. So these principles just work, and what can you do? use the appliances I showed you before, or work some awareness with your people. What's the other problem with the social engineering landscape? It's actually also an observation. Oh, you can see, yeah, maybe you can see it. So you have the heroes, 
and you have the naturals. The heroes are the ones you see everywhere. They do social engineering, they talk social engineering, etc. But also you have the naturals. They actually don't know how they do it. They go there, get free stuff. They get away with the police if they do something. They are just natural what they do, but they can't explain. And the heroes are usually there if there is a topic really new, you know? You have these stars who are there when a topic is new in a world, and it doesn't matter if it's IT or something else. So you have those two groups. But there is a problem with this, you know? The problem with them is there are not enough of those ones there to protect you or your company. The other one is usually they don't have clearance on whatever level. You would like to get them to work on social engineering. You know, the pool gets smaller and smaller. Also, those two types of people, they're usually not, I said, sort of manageable. Usually they are unmanageable. You know, they're worse than soccer players which just fall down. They're princesses, you know, Peter Pan's, Cinderella's, whatever. They're not manageable. You cannot use them in the corporate world. You can use them to get some input. Right? Usually there's also not a structured approach behind this social engineering. It doesn't say you, okay, what's happening here? Why is it happening? Is the risk level increasing, decreasing? Why does it work here? Does it work in other cultures? Right? And the worst problem of it, they usually don't want to work for you. <laughs> so you have these heroes and natural which are good in a topic or in a way, but they're not enough and they're not accessible, so they can't protect you or your corporation. So that's why there is also this kind of framework, because we felt we did a lot, we have a lot of experience in this area, but we need to educate more people, more security officers on this topic. And now, since we have logos, you should, get, you should also get budget for social engineering awareness, right? Good, that's the book. So you can take out your phones or a pen. I will show you a QR code and the number for downloading it for free. That's the link. I think we can make it also available uh, after the session. <clears throat> so it's, the code is 4 on llc 6 x You can also, social engineering is also about how you can remember things. You know, like 4 on is like moron. There's a little bridge, a memory bridge. LL is maybe a little lower. C could be C sharp. But now it's C6X, right? So four on the lower C6. You can maybe remember it this way. Now we'll get you the QR code. I'm not sure if it works if you make the picture now. And uh, <laughs> from experience, when talking about these things and uh, people actually don't believe that there is a book, especially after the story I tell you, it is really a book. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the ebook version. This website exists and it's not a phishing site. So. But maybe be careful. You never know. No, no, I'm a good guy. No problems there. <clears throat> Sometimes. So that's just the structure of the books. We brought in some specific topics about engagement management, governance, risk compliance side of it. What do you do in a professional context? Then what's really new is intensity levels. It's something like you need to agree with your client if you do social engineering engagements like pen testing. Because I think from my experience, I've worked in a lot of settings and environments, the most important thing is no surprises, okay? For anyone in the professional context. So if you agree on pen test, everything needs to be crisp, clear, IP ranges, ports, what do you do? Do you exploit, do you don't exploit? Same for social engineering, even more so, because it's more risky. I have seen, you know, social engineering phishing exercises. That was a complete failure. They were sent out phishing emails to the staff. Everyone on the executive level thought, oh, that's a cool idea, let's do that. That's social engineering, right? Phishing is social engineering. Okay, it's part of it, it's not everything. So they did that, they paid for it, bought it, run the test, sent out these phishing emails. Of course, usually it takes about 7 to 11 minutes until the first moron clicks on a link or on a payload. Guaranteed. So, of course, they failed. Of course, they got to this phishing site, etc. 
So it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for IT. It got an escalation. People were very unsecure after this. After this event, about two weeks later, they sent out a questionnaire from HR. No one responded nearly because they were all afraid. And that's not good. So there is things like intensity levels. You need to make it clear from the beginning what you do with your client or what is the goal of this exercise. <clears throat> the other interesting thing is approach selection method. I won't cover a lot of there, but how you use a different approach with success rate, what's better to use in terms of another approach. I will do some attack vectors. I think that's the interesting bit. Also for uh, social engineering, if you have really good engineers, and usually programmers or admins or whatever are excellent in thinking. So they can also help you develop some awesome attack vectors, really. Then you have maybe people in your organization who want to run social engineering and get out there and get arrested or whatever. But also you have people internally to your company who might are excellent in developing attack vectors. So consider this for them. I got some of the best attack vectors actually from those kind of people with those kind of knowledge. How you develop them, some concept about distance, verbal masking might cover, and some other content. This is just a pyramid, GRC is at the bottom, then it's method and instructions, and method is just a description how you do something, and the instruction is the complete set how you can do it. So a method, you need maybe some knowledge to apply it, or you can be a psychologist or whatever. And with the instructions, kind of everyone can run these things. And of course, skills on top, either you need specific skills or you get specific skills, like a psychologist or some other um, experts to develop attack vectors. GRC++, that's the comments I got. I consider that. Uh, GRC as the base, that was, I, I left it in, you know, don't bore hackers with this, they will die, literally. Okay, everyone's still alive, but I won't cover that. I took it to my heart, and it's security conference, it's not hackers, but anyway. So culture, maybe some of it, ethics, not much use at a hacker conference, I mean at a security conference, I guess, and we will cover those too. Intensity level, that's probably the... The interesting concept we came up with in, within the framework. Because there was always a question, what do you do? As I said before, you have the heroes and the naturals. And I know of some social engineering attacks of friends of me, of course, that they went wrong, completely wrong. So the intention was really good with starting the social engineering, and you can call it the tech, social engineering test, it's maybe better. And then they went, South. So, you know, and then all of a sudden you have a whole lot of problems because you only wanted to do some social engineering. So there need to be clear boundaries. This is also important, these boundaries or these levels, if you do red teaming. Because imagine this, you brief your red team for physical access assessments, you fly them somewhere, they have a job to do, they come back, and you need to make sure that they understand the job, that they stay within your agreed levels. If they have a job of physical entering, it's not a physical break-in, even if they're in a good mood, right? So that's very important. So there are just these levels. Green, well, it's quite easy, it's okay. Level four to six is orange, it's somewhat okay. It's seven to eight, it's red in a professional context. Don't do it and level black is really off the limits. That's maybe more for the three letters acronym companies. So what does it mean? Uh, also, these levels are probably set for 80% of your engagements. Depending where your engagements are, you might need to adjust them, right? So that's just, it, it works really in the, most, in the most areas. Level one, of course, is legal activities, open source, non-invasive intelligence. Level two is simple, local or national corporations. Level three is uh, preservation of a person's or company's integrity. That's most important. If you do this, I believe you're always acting within a green level and you act professionally. It's not about, okay, this person has let me in, this person allowed me to tailgate, this person revealed the password, remote access password. 
you have to preserve a person's integrity. The company you do social engineering testing for, they trust you. But these people working there also trust you. So it's one of these points you need to agree. What do you do? What approach do you take? For maybe um, seeing if access is secure to a certain facility, there are different ways. You can use a car and drive straight through the gate with all the damages. The car is inside, you can out of the car, you go to your location, you're asked to, can you access this location? Of course, you fulfill the task, but you have been way above uh, an agreed level and you won't, go, you won't get another job from them, right? That will be your last engagement for this company. So you have to agree before with the company, with your people on these levels. This can be levels for an engagement. This can be also your personal levels. You say, I'm only operating as a person until level three. Or I say, as a person, I only operate within level four to six. So, but that's your decision, right? And everyone can say in your team, I don't do these engagements. I don't do breaking and entering. I don't want to risk living in an embassy in London or in Russia or in an airport transfer. It's up to you, right? So these are just the levels you agree, and basically it's a part of the engagement. You really take this to your client on the table. You plan the exercise. You say, we won't go above level five. You have the permission to do that, and then you don't go above level five. So that's just one of the elements. Next to it is just sign off uh, and approval levels and some comments. So, you know, it's kind of, if you have team leaders, they can approve this and that. So it's for planning purposes, obviously. Also, it mitigates the risk. If you have an, 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 uh, an exercise or an engagement, you go there, you do this task, all of a sudden you see, you know, like this, this shiny CEO office, which is open, and you see this laptop there and think, my God, this is jackpot. Right? I really want to test this company's security. Actually, you have another job. You have to test the printers and see if they have clear risks. So what do you do, right? So it's also helping you getting over these dilemmas. You can go there and take this laptop and then prove to the company you're so bad. You leave the door open of your offices. I have here the checkpot, the CEO's laptop. But believe me, you won't get any flowers with this approach. Not in the long term. No surprises. This one we will get over quickly. If you have nothing of a framework for yourself and you want to start with social engineering, you can follow these steps. Pre-engagement, engagement phase, and after engagement phase with some important steps in it. Social engineering has some specific risks. It has more risk than just pen testing. You need to think about more things. You need to have more insurances. You need to know how you get your people out of jail or in the first place. Don't get them in there. You need to think about reputation, etc. That's just the whole picture. I think um, I will spare you the boring bits. These are really, if you have a framework for project management or for engagement management, you can reduce to those four steps. Look at them very carefully when you plan. Client selection and acquisition, <clears throat> especially important for social engineering. There is just a problem. You do engagements, you have your client, and you did a lot of these things while I was with the big four. Client risk assessment. Uh, what is this client? What is he doing? What industry? Where does he have his money? With which banks is he working? Uh, what political context is he in? Can you accept this client? And it's really important, because some of the projects you will get asked to do for social engineering will be, you will be just a tool in the end. And that's very dangerous. And all of a sudden, you're maybe involved with the company and your rep reputation halo is together with them. And they're cutting down, you know, for palm oil, some trees in uh, Malaysia, and your name is there as well. So think about those things. Constant checking of your, uh, of your engagements, who you're working with and who you're working for. Then we go ahead. Now it's become more interesting, give you an idea about attack vectors. We have the standard attack vectors. 
you know, security, social engineering is a business too. You cannot, you know, in your room or in your office, work on some cool stuff for a year and then finally go out. It's professional, it's work. So you have the standard simple ones, the tech vectors. The idea is use them, apply them, see if they work, discard them, use another one. Or you have the, what I call the highly sophisticated and customized attack vectors. There, you really put a lot of work in maybe one attack vector to find a single bit of information. You maybe work on someone bringing in to a company for a year, so this person gets a job there, or whatever. So that's the kind of categories you have. Obviously, you cannot develop them if you have such small engagements. Here's the path you follow for developing them, and you develop them always the same way. That's a structured approach. So you define if it's person-based or technological-based, if it's on-site, remote. And then what's what I call, you use a principle. So what is the principle? You can use any of those principles. And these are the principles because social, how social engineering works. It's time-based. So I say, uh, can you give me this information? I should go off quickly. I need to deliver this. I should get this copy job done. Or you use authority. I have order from to execute this. Or maybe it's more a uniform or executing something. So this is how social engineering works. It's often a time-based factor in there. I need this information now. <clears throat> you go in there at 5 to 12 or at 5 to 5. So people are under stress. People cannot react. And people have not a structured way how to react to maybe a demand or a request because there is no escalation path. I don't know who I should call, right? Can I call really now the big boss and ask if he has this and this problem? Or do I need to, what do I need to do? And then errors are happening. And that's the problem. So this is how you go through the attack vectors and how you develop them in a structured way. Also, what you can see is there, you have the intensity levels because you base them on this as well for the development. You say, I develop these attack vectors, but only intensity level six. And every know, everyone knows what you can do, actually. So I see we are a little bit behind. Um, this is basically the principle of developing the attack vectors, um, the principle of what you need to incorporate in those ones. My time is now up. And I think we have also a little bit of time for uh, some questions. So if you have some questions for now, then please let me know. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, my question was uh, regarding whether or not there have been a documented case where uh, uh, a company that does uh, social engineering or red teaming or anything has been attacked itself and directed through SE to a, a given target. For example, there were some someone impersonating uh, someone from a, comp a given company and they managed to uh, make social engineers actually uh, get well social engineered. I don't know if I was clear enough. Uh, <laughs> so the, the question was uh, if there was some impersonation? Uh, if there was anything documented uh, regarding uh, people actually uh, bamboozling social engineers into attacking a given target. I think there is a lot of engineering also voice-based. So there is impersonation in regards to phishing as well, so emails from CEO. Then it's more spear phishing. Spear phishing is more directed to groups. And there is often is a personal note in these phishing emails based on a personal email or communication prior sent out by the CEO. 
So then they use the same letterhead, and that's impersonation as well, uh, to actually attack this, you know, chief financial officers, etc. My this question regard. was not uh, regarding techniques. It was uh, whether or not there were cases of companies that actually do social engineering were approached by people uh, trying to use their skills to not uh, actually test the company, but uh, do an actual attack uh, yes. using, uh, uh, well, yes. without having uh, any authority to authorize that. Uh, multiple questions. So, yes, there are companies doing social engineering and they do test people or they also go through open source, open source in available information and they look for risks based on this information. So they check their staff, their CEOs, their executives, etc., and look what's available on an open source basis or from different platforms like LinkedIn, Xing, etc. Scheme this information for its validity and then they see if there is a, a specific risk. Um, I did for uh, DEF CON 22, it was part of social engineering capture the flag competition and everyone who got in there got the company assigned. Part of this exercise was to find everything based on open source intelligence on this company and this included people and their attack vectors. So you could find out uh, where these executives were going or in our report at least uh, where the next event were. Uh, all sorts of private information, uh, communication, what's available just online. And this then gets used as the basis for the attack vector. So, of course, companies doing that exist. Red teaming is quite common. So, that's, you know, like uh, on a regular basis. Mm. You send out teams to test that. And uh, from an authority perspective, I, I don't understand the question. Of course, they do, they do it too. They use uh, Trojans. There's even a, a Trojan, um, a federal Trojan in the discussion for obtaining information you can later use, of course. So, uh, I, right here, I, think, <laughs> I think one of the things we're trying to say was um, a bad guy, it's like someone that's trying to do corporate espionage, will hire a red team company to break into their competitor, but say that they're from yeah. that company. Yeah. It's like, and I don't think that I've ever seen that happen. I'm not like an expert on that stuff, but it's like, I don't think I've ever heard of an actual case of that, except for maybe the sneakers movie, which was a really good example <laughs> of something like that going yeah. on. But I've never seen anything like that. So uh, that was, I was just trying to help okay. give what he was trying to say. That's okay. what he was trying to say out of it. I mean, in the end, you have to do your due diligence who you work for when you do an exercise and you actually, to a certain extent, never really know who you work for. And I mean, we had this just from the uh, Federal Intelligence Service that made a movie based on an actual case, but it was industrial espionage. And then they showed the social engineering components in this, because based on the, on the real case they had from an in industrial company producing gas turbines, they used this to make this like awareness video. The link was up here, it's quite good. And of course, there was a company hired to do that, and you really know I mean, to assert, that's why it's up there as a risk. <laughs> know who you work for, right? Probably I can't deny, nor can I uh, say yes to it at the moment. I'm not aware of a case right now where you clearly know at the end you're working maybe for, you were just a tool to get. It could also be a competitor. That happens a lot too, through a third party company, try to figure out additional information. Hello. Uh, thank you for the, the talk. Um, when uh, we uh, listen about uh, uh, social engineering talks, we often um, listen about techniques, but uh, not that often about the device himself. And I mean uh, you. And um, I'm, I'm wondering what is uh, uh, the more efficient uh, archetypes to, uh, 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 to do uh, social engineering, if you understand me. Um, I mean, um, uh, social uh, archetypes, you know, of people archetypes. You know, I, I don't know the dumb, the uh, 
to achieve. I don't know. Yeah. You mean wh who's more susceptible to social engineering attacks? Or? No, uh, what, what, what um, um, I mean, uh, when you do a social engineering attack, mm -hmm. uh, the people in front of you uh, react from uh, what he thinks you, that you, what you are. Uh, sorry for my English. Um, um, I, do, I just wonder if there is some, like, I don't know, three best uh, uh, characters that you play to, uh, to do your uh, social engineering attacks. Uh, I think you need to establish a communication first, and you need to do that uh, based on how you approach a person, from where you approach it, and try to establish rapport with this person. So you can you know, just ask general questions. What do you do? I'm from there. I, I, you know, explain also what you do. You don't have to create some crazy story about anything. Just talk. Hey, I was there, and um, what did you do? And, uh, but then it depends. You can, use different, you can either follow what you think is the right direction in the course of your communication, or then you can to apply, try to apply techniques like pacing, leading, NLP techniques. So you want to steer a conversation into a certain direction, you need to do that very slowly. So always do slow steps, approach open and in a way like, like honest, because, uh, and also preserve a person's integrity. And then you might just get the information. Just don't go with the focus, I need this or I want this password, I think. You need to focus more on the context so create a nice environment. People are more likely to talk if they feel comfortable, not if they feel threatened. So create a nice environment and then focus on the context, what's happening around it. You maybe have to go twice. That's often the biggest problem. Just don't go to in there and that's my focus, I want this. That might just block everything from your body language, from the language you use and from you know, to go there, the person feels that usually. So go there, focus on the context, focus on the environment, try to approach. It's like go one step, ask something, go one step back. Maybe you have to come the next day or something. But just don't focus too much on, on your task. I think then it, it will work and the rest, it depends. Establish report, be friendly, uh, greetings, uh, use the, the culture you're in. If you greet, greet like this, the culture you're in or the place you're in and, and become like everyone else in the environment, not become something that's different. Because a person who sees something different thinks, what's different, why is it different? I, I cannot put it in a place. And then it's difficult to open up and to give you information of any sort. And if you reach this point and you get any information, too much. <laughs> not only the one you want. So, my tip is maybe don't be too focused on what you're going to do and just approach it on the basis of a, of a communication and uh, use politeness, establish rapport, which means a good understanding of the language you use or the topic you talk, and then you will get the information you're after. And maybe get it in the second attempt or in the third, but you will get it. I think that's probably the most important thing I can say. Sorry. <laughs>